here just getting uh, a roving mic. And uh, we'll ask you to indicate um, a question and we'll, because we will be streaming this, we'd ask you to just put your hand up if you want to ask a question so that we can record it for the people watching elsewhere in the state. Um, any questions? Well, look, I might start off uh, just with a, a first question for Melissa. Uh, Melissa, you talked about uh, using uh, action research and you talked about uh, how your model had, had quite a significant focus on helping uh, field educators uh, uh, and preceptors, um, in a sense, rethink uh, the approach. Um, I was interested uh, in a couple of parts there where you, where you talked about uh, the strength of using reflective practice and reflection for students. Have, uh, how much has that been pushed as a principle for, for your partners in the field? We, ha we haven't actually gone there with our partners looking at reflective practice. Um, however, what they're now coming back to us saying we like hearing what the students have got to say. So we've shared some of the key components that have come out of those reflections of the students. So it's something in the future that I think we really need to consider. Um, but at the time, we thought it was too confronting to actually yeah. ask the preceptors that's, that to, to write down their story. Uh, but I actually think it would be a very, very worthwhile exercise, particularly in that mental health area, where a lot of it is that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, mentorship and I do wonder with the previous section talking about that burnout and continuously having a student whether having that reflective um, story from preceptors there might enlighten us more uh, from that academic side as well so we didn't we did consider it initially we thought mm -hmm. it would be too intrusive so we backed off but yeah I suppose that could be a regret yeah I was wondering whether there might be a bit of a parallel process in the fear that students had about going out to to practice in mental health areas and then the fear that your preceptors and others had about giving people uh, feedback about their performance. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, think, I think we all see that across um, placements generically um, and I think it becomes even greater in a mental health context because of that big fear of the unknown from a student's perspective. So, and I think that comes down to as well understanding that lived experience more and, and understanding what it's really about rather than seeing it as something that isn't spoken of or, or isn't talked about. So I, I think there's a lot of other things there that could be explored to help that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, might there be a question for Francis, Anthony or Louise? Um, I, I have one. <laughs> um, Francis, you talked about the, the importance of the interprofessional education and um, I'd wonder if you could just expand a bit more. You, you did touch upon some of the issues in getting, uh, in, for example, getting the paediatrician to play a fuller role. But I'd be interested what your reflections are this, this far into the project about the, the IPE model and in particular uh, developing a shared language uh, across disciplines and within disciplines. We are currently getting some feedback from the students. Unfortunately, we just need a few more weeks before we're in a position to deliver that to you. Um, and we'll also be talking to um, the clinical educators and getting their, we're getting um, their feedback on that as well. Um, Robin Dickey and Jill Thistlethwaite work, um, are doing a project with the University of Queensland mm -hmm. in terms of IPE. And they are coming and interviewing the students, um, sitting in on the um, case conferences and some of the other um, delivery modes um, mm -hmm. so that they can assess the students' engagement in the teamwork and in the IPE process. So we've got that kind of running in parallel, but we haven't had an opportunity to report to you yet. Um, I think that the, um, the role of IPE for the students has been certainly about learning about, you know, from, from and of mm. the other professions. Um, I think in terms of, I've mentioned earlier this morning, I think that the clinical educators, certainly some of them express some um, concern about it, supervising um, students who weren't of their discipline. But I think that really what we've used is we've actually used the 
the case conference process mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. significantly. Um, post initial assessment, we've used a, a case conference, and then post an intervention, we've had another case conference, so that, that that's the opportunity really to demonstrate the IPE model by the clinicians and with including Ian's involvement. So, um, and the students actually speak in that, in that forum about the clients that they've seen. Great. Yeah. Yes, uh, just hold on till, the, uh, till <laughs> Ker, Christy with, <laughs> with the raving mic gets to you. This is a bit of a personally biased question as well. We're looking at developing a super clinic in Emerald, which will be a training hub, but also very keen to develop that multidisciplinary um, student-based services and um, looking at sustainability of your model, how are you going to continue to fund it post mm. Mm. Good project? Question. That's our biggest challenge um, and it's alive and well. Um, so there's a couple of things that we've um, that we're doing and um, one of them is that the take coming on Getting, developing that relationship with um, um, medical specialists has, has starting to um, develop a bit of momentum. So the, the model is such that the medical specialist, um, in our, our philosophy I guess in areas like Ipswich and Logan is to bulk bill. Um, so where we're able to develop a relationship with a specialist who's, who's interested in, in a similar kind of framework who's willing to um, bulk bill potentially. Um, we, UQ Healthcare, then look at keeping a percentage of their billings, and we're looking, and so that those billings then go towards assisting us to maintain the clinical um, educator role across the allied health um, disciplines. But it's a jigsaw puzzle for us, so that's one part which wouldn't be able to sustain us completely. The other is that all of the clinical educators or clinical, ex, you know, clinicians have um, a Medicare provider number. So where, um, where the client can be on a um, GP management plan and access to um, um, consultations, then we're using that as another pathway for, for funding or for, for income. We have a strong relationship, as, from our name obviously, but with the University of Queensland and the faculties of health science have actually put forward some funding to um, underscore the, um, the role that we have in terms of um, doing clinical education and research. So that's sort of, so I'm, I'm kind of developing a picture and it's quite an exhausting jigsaw puzzle, but there's three parts of it and I guess we're continuing to look at project and research funding as well. So um, at the moment I, I can kind of, I, I know where some of the money's coming from and, I'm, and I'm work, we're working on where some of the other aspects are. I mean, this morning I mentioned Lucy Dake, and I guess where we're able to develop um, relationships with people, it's been really positive. So she works um, in training the, um, um, excuse me, this is not particularly mental health, but she works in training the um, geriatric advanced trainees. So in her role, because they don't have any continence in that course at the moment, and they want to have access to do a specialist continence clinic, which we're doing, um, she's then giving her training time so when she bills as a consultant, then we retain, hold on to those billings to pay for the specialist nurse and the specialist physio. So I guess um, you know, when you can develop those relationships such that you can then um, leverage from them, um, that's worked in, in our favour. But you know, it's early days. Any other questions? I have a question for Louise and, uh, and Anthony. Uh, you, you, you mentioned in particular uh, the, uh, the recovery model and uh, lived experience approach. My question would be, with those agencies that you, uh, that you found, the ones that you hadn't previously tapped into, how receptive are they to those, uh, to those concepts? Um, they're sort of desperate for recovery training on the whole. Um, the, the big flaw in the government's mental health reform plan to go from a more medically um, oriented system to the recovery approach was that there was zero wide scale education on recovery principles. Um, now we have a, a, a written 
uh, framework that came out in 2013, which predominantly just refers to other documents, to be honest. So for mm -hmm. people who are time poor, um, it's still, it, I mean, yeah. it's not a great answer in the first place because it's far from comprehensive, but it really relies on people chasing up um, other stuff. The m vast majority of people that I come across really do want to embrace, um, well, for a start, they have to. Mm -hmm. um, it's being mandated more um, strictly with each new policy, each new standard, um, and the accreditation, the evaluation of whether recovery is being implemented is being looked at more strictly mm -hmm. as time goes on because there's been an enormous amount of criticism. So, um, yeah, people, people are really keen. Um, in terms of the lived experience-led um, component, like it being lived experience-led, I find that people, it's just like a light bulb goes on. It's like we've been waiting, what is this answer? What is this thing, mm. recovery? Mm. And you briefly explain, they're like, oh, of course, that makes total sense. Can we have some of that, please? Mm. So our issue then is actually capacity um, and not being able to service everyone's needs because there's a limited amount of lived experience people in time and a lot mm. of work to do. From my point of view, I fully agree with Louise. Um, the, the number of people that have um, you know, made themselves available in the teaching of, of our programs has been significant. Mm -hmm. And they're always positive to say, look, we can't you know, criticise the system unless we are going to be a, a change agent. Mm -hmm. And they're very keen to be involved in, in the education of our students to you know, present a different framework for care, and especially when the, the students are involved in community and to transform the way we look at mental health within our community. They're very keen. So we are pursuing now um, locating some of our students with lived experience people in community as part of their clinical practice. Thank you. Is there any final question? Uh, look, I'd like you to join me and thank Louise, Anthony, Francis and Melissa. And now it's, uh, it's time uh, for a wonderful networking opportunity.